how many of you in this room experienced breathing really heavy smoke from Canada's fires a few months ago? A lot of you. And, and fire elsewhere? Yes. So this is happening all over the world. And where I live in, Western, in the Western United States, especially California, we are experiencing that almost every year, multiple times a year. <laughs> um, so mega fire is a climate fueled issue. It's not solely a climate fueled issue though. And it is literally in our face right now. We can do something about it, but we have to act at unprecedented speed and scale. That is for you, John Doerr. We have to move very, very fast. In my talk, I want to tell you why my mega fire is happening. And I want to tell you what we can do about it. I co-founded Vibrant Planet with four brilliant people, a forester and remote sensing expert, a scientist, and the people that built global platforms like Netflix, Meta, and insurance software. I'll tell you about our novel use of generative AI techniques to map forests, keep those maps current, and, and then support natural resource managers and fire districts and utilities on where they can pinpoint treatments to actually do something about that mega fire. At the end of the talk, my goal is that you have hope as we live through this, this next era. This is my church. Every day, I run in the woods, no matter what. I love jumping in a clean stream or, or, a, or a lovely mountain lake while I'm going along, too. Every cell in my body needs that precious time, that hour or two I get in the woods every day. I need to smell that fragrant pine and that pungent soil. I need to hear the creek and the birds babbling at me. You don't want to be around me if I have not had my nature fix. You can just ask my, my teenage daughter. <laughs> uh, my sweet uh, Malamute Aspen goes with me every time. She needs it too. I am very worried that this is what my neck of the woods is going to look like in the next few years. We have entered, but really, we humans have created the age of megafire. Or as forest historian Stephen Pine puts it, he calls it the pyrocene. So a megafire is a fire that grows to more than 100,000 acres and importantly has severe impacts on people and the environment. Forests are literally exploding on us. California's 2020 carbon emissions from wildfires released the equivalent of 24 million cars powered by gas driving nonstop for an entire year. Canada's wildfire emissions from, from just a few months ago tripled the country's carbon footprint. Megafires used to be rare, but now they're becoming increasingly common. But not all fire is bad fire. So more than half of land on Earth is fire adapted or fire dependent in some way. So this means these ecosystems evolved with fire. This is how fire adapted landscapes cycle carbon it's how they cycle nutrients. They need fire to do those things. It's how they maintain an ecologically appropriate number of trees per acre. Fire is also how many fire adapted species regenerate. So pine cones are round and they're covered in flammable sap so that when they catch fire, they roll around and they spread that fiery love all over the forest floor to clean the forest floor so that the mother tree's seeds can find the soil to, to plant. Fire adapted systems thrive with fire, but it has to be the right kind of fire. So today, we have too much of the, of the wrong kind of fire, severe fire or mega fire, and we are seeing massive, often permanent loss of the forest cover. This data is from Global Forest Watch. Dan Hammer is somewhere here speaking today. Um, this data shows forest cover loss from severe fire from 2001 to 2021. So this is not normal and a great deal is at stake. 70% of accessible fresh water, water that's not still locked in ice, originates in forests worldwide. If our forests go, our water supply goes. 80% of terrestrial biodiversity is hosted in forests. Sometimes we silly humans forget that we actually need other species to survive. <laughs> a third of human carbon emissions are removed from the atmosphere by forests each year when they're healthy. Some western forests, like the redwoods, store as much carbon as the Amazon does. We already have the most powerful carbon sequestration machines on Earth. And this technology is ready now. We should invest in it. 
<laughs> we need to invest in the forests we already have, by the way, not future forests. We need to keep them intact. Our drinking water, our food system, our mental and physical health, our recreation-based economies, most of the economies in the West, the tax base is based on recreation. All of that depends on, on these fire-adapted landscapes staying intact. So how did we get here? I'm gonna focus this story on the Western US, but much of this is true in fire-adapted landscapes everywhere in the world. So we made four major mistakes. First, we decimated the original tenders of the land. And we also outlawed the use of fire as a management tool. Trees and people actually arrived on this continent at the same time 20,000 years ago after the Ice Age. And Native Americans used fire, that low intensity fire, to cultivate key plants, to grow medicinal um, plants that they used, and to clear brush for hunting. Fire is part of the reciprocal independent, sorry, interdependent relationship that Native Americans have with nature. Somehow we lost that. Western lands thrived with, cult with cultural fire, and without this tending, our ecosystem started to fail. Big mistake number two. We played out the Lorax, literally. You know, the, the children's book that they got a little greedy and they cut all the trees. So there's actually only 7% old growth left in the West. So if you've been to Tahoe where I live, there's these lush, beautiful forests. They did not look anything like that before Euro European Americans arrived. So we cut all these forests down primarily to build mines and railroads to power the early American economy. This is near where I live in Lake Tahoe in 1876. So cutting all those trees fundamentally disrupted the, the function and the structure of the forest. So big mistake number three, as more people built cute little cabins in the woods and now we have these giant $20 million homes, we got better and better and better at suppressing fire. And remember, we're suppressing fire in a landscape that needs fire to be healthy. So all of this adds up to a perfect storm, creating unnaturally structured, unnaturally thick forest with loads of kindling on the ground beneath the canopy. In some places in the American West, we have two to 10 times the number of trees we would naturally have. So now, when a fire is sparked, it can lit easily ladder up into the forest canopy instead of staying on the ground. It becomes destructive instead of regenerative. So finally, to add insult to injury, we sil silly little humans changed the climate. We warmed everything up. And this means that all these overgrown forests with all that kindling underneath the canopy is tinder dry. So fires are now moving faster than we can keep up with, and we are losing lives as we saw with paradise, and most recently in, in, in Maui, in Hawaii. So this is the age of megafire, and it is just the beginning, and none of us want to live in this world. So here's the hopeful part. Unlike many other climate-related issues, we can actually do something about me megafire. We know that we cannot suppress our way out of this. So then what's the answer? So this is the holy grail. Restoring humanity's stewardship relationship with nature. In fire-adapted landscapes, that relationship has to include good fire, as Native Americans have always known and, how, and what they practice. Beneficial fire is the foundational fix for megafire. In order to live safely with good fire, we can make our homes and our communities defensible removing vegetation around them. We can retrofit and build with fire-resistant materials. We can change roofing materials as well. We can even add climate uh, fire-smart sprinkler systems to wet houses down if a fire is coming. So, of course, we have to do this equitably. That's a big problem. That's key. We can also get a lot smarter about where we build and where we don't build. The big opportunity, though, is to build resilience in the broader wildlands around communities so that fire stays on the ground. So by removing those small trees and ladder fuels, all that kindling on the ground through mechanical thinning and prescribed fire, we can restore a resilient forest structure and ecosystem function so that, all that, so that, the, so that the fire becomes regenerative again and isn't destructive. We have unfortunately have it, had it hammered into our brains that cutting trees is bad. 
But in fire adapted forests, we often have to cut some trees before we can benef get beneficial fire back on the land. We have to cut trees to save forests. This incredible image from the Klamath tribe up in Oregon um, was taken right after the bootleg fire. This is a massive fire and it kind of says it all. So where they had done, the tribe had done both thinning and prescribed fire, that the forest is gonna be fine. The fire came in, it hit the ground, and it actually became a regenerative forest. Where they did just mechanical thinning, no prescribed fire, that forest, some of it'll, some of it'll make it, but a lot of it won't. And then you can see at the top of the image here where they didn't do any treatments, that, that forest will never come back. So we just need to scale up what we know works. And much of that knowledge lives with Native American tribes. So the problem is the scale of this is so massive and change is happening so rapidly that now it's all about prioritization. So we have to sequence our actions to keep the most at-risk critical places intact before we lose them. And that's where technology like AI comes in. So at Vibrant Planet, we are using remote sense data, LIDAR, satellite imagery, and we train a machine learning algorithm to map forests at unprecedented fine scale. And ke we keep those maps current. So we can always have a sense of what are the current conditions, what's the current state of resilience of a landscape. And then we, we empower natural resource managers, utilities, fire districts to pinpoint where do we go to get the most bang for the buck to actually create that, that broader landscape resilience? So let me break this down a little bit. So it's a little bit like the remote sensing piece. It's a little bit like having millions of me and my dog Aspen running around the forest, picking up everything we can about it. So how many trees there are, how the water is moving through the forest, what animals are in the canopy and below the canopy, how carbon's being stored. So we're basically feeling the overall resilient state of the forest. And then we also map buildings and roads and cell towers, cultural sites as well, um, all the, all the human-built stuff. And then natural resource managers can use the system to understand where all those built and natural assets are actually at risk. <clears throat> and in fact, in our audience today, um, we just merged with a company called Pyrologics, and they are the best damn fire model modelers on Earth. So one of them is here today. He lives here in Boston. Um, then managers can actually run scenarios. They're very rich and they happen in real time to understand what can we do about that risk? How do we pinpoint treatments? We always have limited resources. We can't walk hundreds of millions of acres. So the system's basically helping them pinpoint where do we go to restore forests so that we can avoid the most catastrophic losses and enhance ecosystem services the most. So they can do that adaptively. So as conditions are changing, if a fire hits at one of their landscapes, they can then say, okay, where do we go now? Treatments can even include adding connectivity corridors for wildlife, hugely important for, as a climate solution. And then we can also reintroduce ecosystem super, superstars like beaver. This guy's going into a degraded little wetland area. And beavers bring these unbelievable outsized carbon water biodiversity benefits. Literally within like four years, a meadow can spring back to life. So they, they, they dam up the rivers. We can also create analog beaver dams as humans. Plant willow and, and, and all the little fingers of streams will go out and those create huge um, carbon sinks and they host tons of biodiversity and they actually cl clean out the water system. We used to have 600 million of these little guys. Um, they were the original engineers of healthy landscapes in the West. They also create a refuge for other wildlife when fire hits, and they also keep the, the foundation of the landscape intact. And by the way, I heard that MIT's mascot is a beaver, which is brilliant, because MIT people are brilliant, right? <laughs> um, so the system will get smarter and smarter and smarter over time. So you can imagine thousands of projects in the system, and we're learning from input from the ground, from the people that are using the system, as well as from remote sensing, the pattern recognition of what works best in what socio-ecological circumstance. So in closing, I co-founded Vibrant Planet with these unbelievably brilliant people to solve the megafire crisis and to try to help restore that human relationship with nature, that stewardship relationship. So I started this company because I want the trees to see my daughter this is where I'm going to try to hold it together. Um, to see my daughter and her daughter and her daughter's daughter jump in the crystal clear water like I do. <sighs> Thank you. 
And as others have said today, we need thousands of young people, like the one that just spoke, to come into this restorative economy. We have to build a restorative economy, and there is a ton of work to do. But if we're successful, we'll have thousands of climate-smart jobs. Um, there's a ton of amazing stuff to do in places like this. So nature is ready for us. We need to move very, very fast. And I hope that you will join this restoration economy that we've been hearing about. Thank you.